Chapter 9 The sitting room was dark, the dying fire insufficient to banish the shadows which devoured swan leg tables, upholstered chairs, and fur strewn divans. The room's only occupant didn't stir to replenish the flame, content to sit and study the darkening wall as he drained the contents of the crystal goblet in his hand. The intensifying gloom was a perfect companion to the pole covering his heart. Lord High Justice Igor Markov didn't stir as the door to the sanctuary opened. Dancing candlelight fought against the darkness threatening to engulf him. He didn't care who this midnight violator of his tranquility might be. It was much too late for that. He had devoted his life to making his name respected and feared throughout Wurtbad, in the murky dens of petty thieves and the polished halls of the nobility. It was only now that he really understood how tenuous and fleeting such power was. With their parting, they had left little but a shell of a tired, frightened old man. Markov took another swallow from the glass. It might not be possible to restore his strength out of a bottle, but he knew he could find oblivion in one. Dimly, words began to filter through the darkening haze. Harsh, angry words, accusatory words. How could he have let such an atrocity come to pass? How could he have engineered such a hideous scheme? Once he had been a man worthy of respect, even emulation. Now the self he had shown to the world was revealed to be nothing but a sham, unmasking a murderous coward within. Enough, girl! Markov lifted his hand, begging his daughter to cease her tirade. He forced his eyes to remain fixed upon the wall. She had been there, at Otwin Keep, when Meiser carried out his orders. She would not be silenced. Markov smiled thinly, a tiny ember of pride flickering in the gloom. There was so much strength in her, so much more than the gods had seen fit to bestow upon her father. How? Silja's words cut at Markov like a dull knife. How could you have conceived such a horror? How could you allow such wanton murder to be perpetrated in the name of the Baron? What good would it do to deny your accusations? Markov sighed. Oh, I am not pleading my innocence. Far from it. I am as guilty as any of the others. Those great and noble lords so very concerned about the welfare of their mighty city. He drained the last dregs of schnapps out of his goblet. It was the Baron's great vision. Markov stated. It was Meiser who gave it form and substance, the rest of us who gave it life. I've always had a good head for logistics, for efficiency, the magistrate said. The Baron has always appreciated that. Left on his own, Meiser would still be wondering in which direction the keep was in. Was in, he corrected himself. Then it was your idea, your plan, Silja hissed back at him. The fire in her gaze had little to do with her reddened face and the salty trails staining her cheeks. Her knuckles widened as Silja's anger drained into them. All these years I've admired you, tried to follow your example. What a fool I was to be so blind. Markov rose from the chair, turning to glare at his daughter. You would have me play the fool then, he snapped. Stand aside and refuse to have anything to do with the Baron's mad scheme. Just let Meiser ooze his way deeper into his good grace. Would that please you? Would that make you proud? But you are the Lord High Justice, Silja began to object. Markov shook his head, scoffing at his daughter's protest. Simply another instrument of the Baron's will. What power I have, what authority I have, is because the Baron allows it. A snap of his fingers, a stroke of his pen, and I am no more powerful than the rat-catcher in the sewer. There must be someone you can turn to. Silja's voice had lost some of its venom. Her father's pain, frustration, and disgrace touching her heart. Markov shook his head. Who? The Grand Theogonist? The Emperor, maybe? Or maybe our gracious Elector Count, who has set a ring of steel around this city, and is perfectly content to wait and watch it die. No, Silja, there is no authority I can appeal to. Markov's hand began to tremble. 
Baron von Gartz is the only law in Wurtbad. While the quarantine is in effect, he may as well be Sigmar himself returned. Then madness rules Wurtbad, Silja swore. Her anger flared as she looked upon her father's trembling frame. She had come here to confront a traitor, an archfiend who had engineered the deaths of thousands. Instead, she only found a broken, defeated old man. She turned, striding from the chamber, until once again she stood upon the threshold. Tell me, father, she said, voice a withering snarl. When the baron next calls for his sycophants to endorse whatever insanity stirs his rotten mind, will you crawl to him on your belly like a dog, or will you have enough dignity to stand before him like a man? Silja did not wait for the answer, disappearing into the maze of hallways which formed the Ministry of Justice. Markov stared at the empty doorway for a time, then contemplated the empty goblet in his hand. It would be so easy to ignore her words, to sit out the storm. But she was right. The Baron was dangerously mad, more of a threat to the city than the plague he was obsessed with destroying. But Markov's days of boldness and bravery were behind him. All he wanted now was to live his few remaining years in peace, to enjoy the rewards of his labors in the time left to him. Someone else could try to counter the influence of the Baron. He tried to forget the contempt in his daughter's words. But even with the schnapps dulling his mind, Markov couldn't banish the accusations. With a deep growl, the magistrate hurled the goblet into the fire, watching it as it shattered into a hundred shards of starlight. He grabbed up his cloak from where he had lain it across one of the divans. If he was unable to forget, then the time may have come to act in such a way that he would not be ashamed to remember. Furchtegott slammed the book closed, too angry to experience the repugnance that crawled up his spine whenever he touched the binding of the moldy old grimoire. The mystic wiped his hands on the golden robes. Thus Buchdi und Holden seemed to grin back at him with a mocking smile. He had consulted many tomes of magic since taking up the mantle of a wizard, and learned many disquieting, profane secrets in the studies. Knowledge that, some insisted, man was never meant to know. But the ponderous volume compiled by the witch-hunter Helmuth Klausner, from the writings of warlocks and sorcerers he had condemned throughout his career, was another matter entirely. The book almost seemed to be alive, possessed by a malicious intelligence. Pages would turn of their own volition, even when weighted down by lead ingots. The book would never remain where Furchtegott remembered leaving it, always manifesting itself in some unusual spot in the laboratory, some place it had no right to be in. Most frustrating of all, however, was the way in which it seemed to guard its secrets. The way texts seemed to slither from one page to the other, as though evading the prying eye that sought to decipher it. At one hour of the clock, an ancient fertility rite of the old faith might be found beside the foul practices of an Arabian snake cult. At the next, it might have moved much deeper in the book, lurking between a necromancer spell for instilling vigor in undead automatons, or a Norse shaman ritual for bestowing the curse of a werekin upon a warrior. The words themselves were cryptic, written in a dazzling array of languages, every sentence written with double meaning and deliberate contradiction. Some of the ciphers the long-dead witches and enchanters had used to guard their spells were among the most complex Furch the God had ever seen. Even without the book's malevolent trickery, dredging anything useful out of its pages was a study in frustration. He should have destroyed the damn thing, reduced it to slag with his own spells. But he allowed its power to seep back into the air around him. No, anger would not help him now. He had to keep his mind clear, to consider the best course of action. Baron von Gotts was deteriorating at a faster pace than Furchtegott had imagined possible. Whatever the spell had been, it was working its unholy sorcery quickly. The wizard reflected on how easily the first spell had revealed itself to him, that ritual said to preserve a man against the ravage of disease and plague. It had been almost as if Das Buch Dion Holden had abandoned its usual tricks and misdirection in order to ensure first the god's ruin. The wizard looked over at the heavy beechwood shelves that loomed against the walls of his workshop. This accursed grimoire would not help him, but he had other resources to call upon. 
A wizard of the gold order was an alchemist as well as a conjurer, and the array of chemicals, powders, and elixirs resting upon the shelves represented the tools of his art. Among them were compounds and concoctions so deadly even a murderous Tylean poisoner would hesitate to employ freely. It had become a choice of life or death, the Baron's life or his own. Ferchtegott realized that was really no choice at all. He walked to the shelf and removed an iron bottle. The way the Baron was gorging himself, Ferchtegott was certain there would be ample opportunity for the contents to find their way into his stomach. Herr Dr. Freiherr Weiss sucked at his finger as he studied the prone figure lying on the floor of the cage. Quite an interesting specimen, he concluded, ignoring the unease that flickered deep within his subconscious. The Skaven had dragged him out of the river, or so the claw leader that brought the man to Weiss claimed. Not the most healthy of environments in the best of times, and with his manufactured plague still ravaging the city, these certainly were not the best of times. Still, mere sickness was an inadequate explanation of the man's many abnormalities. His temperature was far colder than it should have been. Respiration and pulse were so faint as to be almost imperceptible. And, of course, there was that thick trickle that oozed out of the man's forearm when Weiss cut him. The doctor had seen a lot of blood in his life, but he would swear that the filth slopping through the specimen's veins was not blood. Even the black pollutant that coursed through the bodies of the Skaven had more in common with human blood than what was drawn from the man's wound. A mutant, Weiss decided, but not like any he had studied before, or even created. It was unfortunate that the specimen seemed to have lapsed into some kind of coma. The sharp smell of rat musk drew Weiss from his thoughts. The scientist turned around to observe Skilk and his bodyguards scuttling through the laboratory, causing the Skaven working the bigger furnaces and the presses to abase themselves and squirt their pungent fear scent. Doctor Man, Skilk snickered as the horned Skaven hobbled towards Weiss. Progress, like here, match match. I am trying some new compounds, Weiss explained, unable to keep the fear out of his voice. The words clearly didn't appease his inhuman patron. Gracier Skilk's face split in a menacing smile, fangs like daggers. Weiss took a step back, fearful that Skilk's patience had finally reached its limit. Suddenly, the ratman's head cocked to one side, whiskers twitching. Man thing, die die soon! Skilk declared as he peered into the cage. Doctor man make bad bad drink? The grin was back on its verminous face. No, Vice protested. He was brought here in that condition by your people. My potions will help him make him strong again. Skilk chittered his laughter, shaking his head. Somehow, watching the Skaven make such a common human gesture was more unsettling than his natural habits. Death smell never speak false, Skilk stated, one claw tapping the side of his snout. Die, die, quick soon. Food for Dr. Man's Warren. The color drained from Vice's face. Of all the disgusting habits of his caven patrons, their penchant for human flesh was the vilest. Any meat would appease their voracious appetites, even that of their own kind. Man flesh was no different. Weiss had long ago been forced to allow his subjects to be consumed when they expired from his experiments. The scientist averted his eyes, trying not to think any more upon the gruesome subject. I have a few more preparations I will be trying upon the latest batch of subjects, Weiss announced, gesturing for the Skaven priest-sorcerer to follow him. Skilk waited for the man to lead the way. Skaven leaders were especially wary of allowing their underlings to linger behind them at least those leaders who wanted to live long. Skilk watched as Weiss prattled about his latest experiments, his black soul secretly mocking the man. Weiss was clever, for a human, but stupid too. He really did believe Skilk was interested in the healing properties of Warpstone. That idiot. Skilk was not sick. What did he care about curing any disease? The doctor man was too foolish to see that Skilk was studying the effects of Warpstone upon humans learning how much, or how little, was required to corrupt it. Men were a violent, frightful breed, their minds moved by strange motivations and imaginings. 
they could not endure the taint of mutation among their own, unless that taint manifested in one of their nestlings produced by their own breeder. Then they would try to defend what they would otherwise destroy, forming strange alliances to protect their own from those they had formerly called protectors. It was another of the many weaknesses pervading the human race, their curious affection towards others of their kind at the expense of their own well-being. It made little sense to Skilk, and the Gracier had spent his entire life studying humans after the example of his mentor, Gracier Kripsnik. But Skilk did not need to understand it to exploit it, any more than Kripsnik had truly understood the human lust for the yellow metal when he conceived of flooding the lands of men with poison coins. It was enough to know that a weakness was there, waiting to be used. The world of men would tear itself apart from within. Skilk would be the instrument of that final triumph, polluting their cities in ways that the plague monks of Pestilence and the warlike engineers of Scryer had never even dared imagine. Then it would be his name, not that of Fankwall or Nodum or Morskitar, that would be preeminent among the Order of the Grey Seers. He who would be acknowledged as the one true prophet of the Horned Rat. The paws of the grey seer scratched at his fur as he listened to Vice's explanation. Its own secret dreams and ambitions kept secret behind the Skaven's beady eyes. The dank stench of the sewers was overwhelming, overpowering even that of the shambling shapes that silently marched alongside them. Carandini would have preferred the noxious reek of his zombies. To him, the stench of death and decay was comforting. It smelled like power. The necromancer exerted his will, compelling the two zombies carrying him through the river beneath Vurbad streets to stop. The former priests of Moor complied, their ungainly husks swaying slightly as Carandini's weight shifted. The Thalian scowled as he considered how very close he had come to being dropped into the mire that soaked the zombies' feet. The mighty Death Master fears getting his feet wet. A hissing voice laughed out of the shadows. Carandini could see Sibekai's smoldering eyes in the darkness. The necromancer silently cursed the vampire. Let it laugh, he told himself, for the necromancer would laugh louder when he spat on Sibekai's ashes and stamped them into the dust. Are we close to the castle yet? Carandini demanded. The sewers of Urbad were not extensive, certainly not as all-encompassing as those of Null nor Aldorf where the entire city was served by a network of underground canals and channels. The sewers of Wurtbad extended only beneath the wealthier districts, allowing the elite of the city to enjoy the same comforts they enjoyed when traveling to the Empire's other great cities. The brick-lined tunnels conducted a waste out into the stir, spoiling the riverfront even as the noses of the wealthy were spared. The vampire's skeletal face leered. It had been Sibekai's plan to use the sewers. It had returned to its lair after reconnoitering the area around the Schloss von Gotz, the travels taking it close to the river and the culverts which drained the sewers into the stir. Carandini had to reluctantly admit that Sibekai's plan was well plotted, if a bit odious. Not so far now, Sibekai pronounced. We are beneath the royal quarter. Carandini did not bother to ask the vampire how it knew such things. The supernatural senses of the undead were impossible for a mortal mind to comprehend. Suddenly, the vampire snapped around. Carandini could see its lips pull away from its fangs. Sibekai seemed to glide towards the wall, its feet causing not even a ripple upon the foul waters. Its clawed hand reached out, pulling one brick free. Carandini expected mud or dirt to spill from the wall, but instead there was only darkness. Sibekai tossed the brick into the filth at its feet. It seems we are not the only sappers beneath Wurtbad, Sibekai mused. The strong box of some thief, Carandini postulated. The vampire shook its head. I can feel the air stirring here. It must open into a tunnel of some kind, and not some ruffian's hiding place. Carandini snapped his fingers, motioning for the zombies to advance. The rotting workers began to chip at the wall with picks and hammers. This tunnel of yours may be an old escape route out of the castle, Carandini observed. 
If it is, our work will be much easier. There are many fell powers in the night, necromancer, Sibekai declared. Some of them older and more merciless even than the houses of the vampires. His eyes shone with a terrible intensity. If you still pray to any of the gods of men, pray that we find only dirt and stone and nothing more. Carandini watched as the opening to the sewer wall grew, finding Sibekai's words of warning more frightful even than the monster's threats. It was not wise to ponder what kind of creature could evoke caution even in a mighty vampire. A curse echoed about the old torture chamber, as Strang tossed aside the shovel to remove the large stone that disturbed his digging. Fulman couldn't quite kill the smirk that grew on his face. His henchman never did have the heart for manual labor. The heaps of dirt set against the walls continued to rise. The witch hunters might not have been experienced miners, but their enthusiasm was a worthy surrogate. Stripped to the waist, the Templars attacked the blocking tunnel with vigor, hacking away at the earth and the stone as though it were the neck of the enemy. Captain Justicar Erhardt stood in reserve, powerful arms folded across his chest, waiting for the diggers to uncover any large stones that his immense strength could remove. Fulman could well understand the drive that motivated these men. The Skaven had violated the sanctity of their chapter house, caused the ignoble death of their comrades. Already the diggers had uncovered one of their brothers, crushed and suffocated by the tunnel's collapse. The steady pace of the diggers had increased after that discovery, more eager than ever to come to grips with the loathsome underfolk. But it was not thoughts of retribution that stirred Fulman's mind. Hansel Gruber was dead. Whatever the plague doctor could have told him died with him. His killers were now the only link to Vikes. The witch hunter looked at a hole his men were tearing into, almost wanting to see a rodent snout, furry bodies and clawed hands spill into the chapter house again. Fulman gripped the pistols in his hands. He would need to be careful with his shouts. Some of the underfolk could speak and understand the Reichspiel to converse with men. If Fulman could capture such a beast, it could have some very interesting things to tell him. He looked at the two Templars beside him, their pistols held at a ready. He had given orders to shoot to maim, hoping they would master their emotions long enough to show some restraint. Fulman spun around as a foot struck the stone floor behind him. It was not some rat-faced fiend, but one of the chapter house's young page boys. The boy's eyes were on the filthy carcass strength had drawn from the corridor outside and then thrown into a corner of the chamber. You should not be here, Fulman stated. Go back upstairs. There is a visitor to see you, sir, the page reported. Silja Markov, should I send her down? The boy's eyes strayed to the unnatural carcass of the Skaven. Silja had seen enough horror for one night. The least thing Fulman could do was spare her the sight of such an abomination. No, he replied. I will see her in the reception hall. Please tell her I will come to her directly. The page needed no further encouragement, hurrying out of the subterranean chamber. Fulman gave orders to the men to maintain their vigilance while he was gone, encouraging them to take one of the ratmen alive, if at all possible. His thoughts turned to Silja, and the purpose of her arriving so late. The witch hunter sighed as he mounted the steps. The last thing he needed now was more bad news.